All right, so these are your notes for Chapter 5. And so we're going to give you a couple of things to focus on, which again, for those of you that are struggling with your notes and you feel like you're just writing a bunch of words, you don't really know what to do with them, maybe this will provide you with some focus. These are four questions that you need to be able to answer. Now, do you have to write them all down now? Not necessarily. You know these will be online later. You can get them in if you want to. Maybe you just want to think about them. That's okay too. But the hope is that by the time we're done with this chapter, and this unit on the first five chapters, you will have some idea of why the classical civilizations fell. And when we say classical civilizations, who do we mean? China, India, Greece, and Rome. Civilizations that went beyond just the basic characteristics of, of civilization. So we want you to have some sense of why they fell. We want you to know where the new ones are popping up. Because clearly, in the world that we live in today, civilization is not only in China, India, and Greece and Rome. Civilization has spread to cover the majority of the planet. So where did the next ones pop up, and why? Why did they pop up there? And we've talked from the beginning of the year on about how history is not really just a series of inevitable events, but it's really a series of choices, happenstances, coincidence, and sometimes just dumb luck. And so looking at why is really important. And then the fourth question, we had these classical civilizations in China, India, and the Mediterranean, and then they fell, and we're supposed to care about them for some reason. So the last thing we want you to walk away with is a sense of why those places matter. Why are they worth talking about at all, especially today, 3,000 years later? So that's what hopefully you will get out of this as we finish up this unit on the Foundations era. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, let's start off with a couple of themes. Yes, sir. Yes. Chapter five. No, you are. That was just for chapter four that you didn't get notes. All right, so as we look at these classical civilizations declining, there's a couple of relationships that I want you to be aware of. And some of you have already come and asked for help, and so you've got a head start on this, because we talked about this. There is a direct inverse relationship, for those of you that are math-oriented. There's a direct inverse relationship between government and religion in most early societies. If one is strong, the other is weak. Yes, sir? Government and religion. Now, in India, which of the two is strong? Religion. And what do we know about India's government? It's weak. It's loosely organized. It's regional. There's nobody that has a lot of power. There's no lot of consistency. Religion is what keeps that society together. Now, we look at China. What do we see in China? Strong governments. And what's noticeably lacking? Religion. Then we look at the Mediterranean. Oops, sorry. Look at Athens and Greece. What do you notice? Strong government. Weak religion. Now, weak religion doesn't mean they don't have religion. Weak religion just means that religion is not what keeps society together. If you look at the religions in the Mediterranean, and this was something that the group that talked about religion discussed in their part of the Socratic seminar, and I was so happy to see it, because it's actually a fairly advanced idea. If you stop and think about the Greek and Roman religions, what do you notice about them? How do they compare to other major religions? Take a second and just stop and think, kind of analyze it. 
Where do they differ? All right, let's see what you got. Say hey. How so? Okay. So we see a couple of similarities with Hinduism. They're polytheistic, and because their stories are all written down, it's a you know a form of literature which then encourages literacy in those societies. So that's good. All right. All right, they're kind of secular religions. You look at the gods, and the gods are disturbingly human. You look at Zeus. You look at Hades. You look at Ares. These are very, very human characters. They do a lot of dumb things. They do a lot of wrong things. I mean, what does it seem like Zeus is always doing? He's making babies. He is seducing human women. He's seducing demigods. He's seducing other goddesses. I mean, this guy is running around impregnating just about any woman he can find. But when we think about God, we typically think of God as a moral example as someone to base your behavior on. Is there any society in the world that will uphold Zeus as the male role model? Okay, maybe a weird one. <laughs> and so if you look at how the Greek and Roman gods act, they're not an example, they're a soap opera. They're like the first reality TV show. It's like Real World or Big Brother or The Bachelor or whatever. I mean, and I apologize if you actually like those, but they're stupid. Not that I'm judging you, but they're stupid shows whose only purpose is really designed to entertain you by making you feel better about yourself because you realize how dumb they're, how some people out there are. That's why we enjoy reality TV so much. That's not something that's going to hold society together because if people start acting like those gods, what's going to happen to society? Chaos. Absolute chaos. And so what we see is that government in that case was very, very strong and there was a strict set of laws. How does Rome base their, what does Rome base their society on? What are their laws called? The Twelve Tables. They have a strict, clear, concise set of laws that everyone abides by and that's what holds society together. Now on the flip side, you look at India. What holds India together? Specifically? What about Hinduism? The caste system. The caste system provides everybody with clear, succinct directions, not only on where you are in society, but how to live your life. You follow your dharma. If you do so, you get good karma, and you are rewarded in your next life. If you don't, you are punished. Society can now function within those rules. And so you see this inverse relationship. When religion is strong, government can afford to be weak and ineffective. When government is strong, religion does not play as much of a critical role. Why are we talking about this now? Well, what happens when these classical civilizations fall? What happens to their governments? They crumble. They collapse. The government structures no longer function efficiently. The leaders are either no longer in place because they've been removed or they've left or whatever. The bureaucracy falls apart because there's nobody at the top of the chain of command. In some cases, the government buildings themselves have been destroyed by invaders. The government is not in a position to function. And so what will now step in to allow society to continue? Religion. So if you're in India, what's going to keep society functioning? Hinduism and the caste system. What's going to happen in the Mediterranean? Christianity. Christianity. A new religion that provides a moral code of behavior that people can base their lives on because government is no longer doing what it was supposed to do. We're going to see this relationship play out time and time again throughout history. When one of these two entities is strong, 
The other is almost always weak. It doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean it's not playing a role. But it's usually only one or the other that is in charge. Sahil? Oh, that's a really good question. Is bad government the result of corruption or is it the cause of corruption? That's your question, right? That's kind of one of those chicken or egg arguments. Um, you know, does corruption lead to bad government or does bad government lead to corruption? And they kind of happen simultaneously because we're talking about people at the end of the day. We're not talking about, you know, constructs. Right. And so because there are people involved, there are going to be selfish people. There are going to be greedy people. There are going to be dishonest people that will start to make government less effective. And so then as more of the government becomes less effective, more and more people realize, man, I can't do my job here. I might as well just look out for me. And so it becomes cyclical and the problem seems to grow. And it will take one person or a group of people to step in and say, no, this is enough. We shall have no more of this. We're going to clean the house. And a whole bunch of people get fired and or killed. And that can sometimes make things better. But it's a great question. Well, right. That's never good. Serena? Uh, uh huh. Yeah. The uh, Han Dynasty comes unglued because of corruption and because of those pesky Huns. And the dynasty ends. And there's a period of about 200 years where there is no central government. And China begins to fragment and turn into regional kingdoms, kind of like India. And then after about 200 years, a new dynasty will form and gradually bring everybody back together. But for that short time, central government collapses. And what will people turn to in China? Don't say Confucianism. Buddhism, a brand new religion that's been imported from India, which provides you with a moral code on how to live in place of a government that's no longer functioning. It's funny how often you see this pattern take place. All right, so that's one of the first things. Similar relationship is going to exist between what we call classical societies or primary societies or core societies. We're going to see the same relationship between those core societies and what we call fringe groups. So it's real simple to picture. The core societies are in the middle. They're the ones that are successful. They're the ones that are big and powerful. Who are our core societies right now before they fall? Rome, Greece, China, India. So if you picture Rome on a map or China on a map and this much is China, what's going on out here right outside of that circle? Is it like barren wasteland? There's no people, there's no human life, nothing? Right. There are people there. There are people all over the planet by this point. It's just that they're not all living in cities. And so the people on the outside of this, who are they? They're nomadic people. They're hunter-gatherers. They're people that haven't bought into the agricultural life yet. And if you think back to the article we read at the beginning of the year, how come they haven't bought into agriculture? Because they don't want it. Because they look at farmers as what? As lazy. People that sold out. People that lost their true culture. People that lost their edge. They've gone soft. They sit around all day, those lazy farmers. They're not tough like we are. They don't understand nature like we do. They can't track animals through the forest anymore. They go out to their field and they're eating grain. How boring is that? What we see happening when those core societies start to fail, when those major cities turn inward and start to feed on themselves through corruption and through greed, we see these fringe societies looking at those lazy farmers and going, man, we could show them how to do things right. The Huns start drooling at all of the wealth and comfort available in China, in Rome, and imagining how much better life would be if they invade and take those things and show those poor lazy farmers how they should actually live their life. And so again, direct inverse relationship. As classical societies begin to weaken and decline, fringe societies around them will become more and more powerful, more and more brave and confident 
and oftentimes you will see a reversal of power as fringe societies invade, take over, conquer, and establish new governments or societies. Uh, after what you know, Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. Every classical civilization, especially when things aren't going well, and it's no different today. I mean, what are we struggling with today in this country? Bad economy, right? And so, what's everybody doing right now in the midst of a bad economy? What are we wishing for? Okay. For some people, they they're wishing for a new president, new jobs, but everybody is inspired by what happened before. Everybody wants to just turn this ship around and go backwards about 10 years when everything was good and then park it. And let's just sit here. Let's sit here in 2002 when life was good. When we were making money and house prices were up and people were hiring, everybody had a job, and everything was just flowers and candy. Puppies and unicorns, whatever. Life was good. Was life really perfect 10 years ago? No, but 10 years forward, do we now have that impression of what it was? Oh yeah, oh life was great 10 years ago. I loved life 10 years ago. Actually, no I didn't, because actually yeah, I did, I was in college. That was a good time. Okay, I take that back. <laughs> But we have this tendency to romanticize the past, to look backward and we go, oh, that was so good back then. Do you remember that? Life was perfect. Life was perfect. We do it with our relationships. One second, Dave. We do it with our relationships. You date somebody, you break up. It's like six months later. And you're looking back on it like, why did we break up? We were so happy together. It was so good. And then sometimes they get back together again. And you're like, oh, that's why we broke up. Now I remember. We do it with jobs. You had a job. You get fired from the job. You leave the job. You go to a new job. And you're looking backwards like, God, oh, that job was so good. The job was so easy. When I used to wait tables in a pizza restaurant, that was the best job ever. I got to interact with people. I was always on my feet and moving and challenging my brain. The job was so good. If I went back, I'd be like, this is why I left. Because there are some nights where I make 20 bucks in tips. Can't live on that. Yes, David. Uh, oh, yeah, indeed. Hindsight is definitely much better than 2020. Yeah, I like that. 20 nostalgia. That's good. I like that. History is no different. Civilizations are no different. Because the only thing that we have to base our decisions on is either the present or the past. Since we can't look into the future, those are our only two sources of information. And so oftentimes what we find is that as these civilizations start to decline, they look backwards and they're like, oh, wouldn't it be so great if we could go back to this? Remember when life was good and easy and everything worked? And some people are scratching their heads like, no, I don't remember that because it never happened. But those people are like, oh yeah, sure it did. Remember that time where we were rich and happy and wealthy? The streets were paved with gold and there was a rainbow in the sky every day? You don't remember that? It's great. So yeah, to answer your question, there are often times where as civilizations are recovering from their fall, they're going to try to recapture those glory days. Guess how well that works? Not at all. All right, so two other common themes we're going to see real quick. Civilizations never, ever, 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 ever fall for one reason. Civilizations never fall simply because of invaders. China did not fall only because of the Mongols. Rome did not fall simply because of the Germanic barbarians. India does not fall only because of the Huns. I mean, think about Rome. Rome at its peak. Rome's military might. Is there any chance a group of disorganized barbarian savages defeat Rome if Rome is at its peak? No chance. No chance. No chance you end the civilization. Maybe you win a battle. Maybe you capture a city. There is no chance you end the civilization. 
But if you wait till that society is weak, if you wait till the government is disorganized, if you wait until the people are unhappy, if you wait until disease has crippled society, now what are your chances? Much better. It is never just invasion. Invasion plays a role, but there are always internal and external factors. The external would be the invasion. The external would be an outbreak of a plague or a natural disaster. But those things can all be dealt with if internally society is functioning, if the government is equipped to deal with problems, if the people trust in their government, if there are resources available to help others. But if there are problems internally and then there are external problems, you're screwed. Yes, sir. Because they're on the fringe. They're always there. They're always just outside, and so they see it. And oftentimes, it's not like these nomads are just sitting there twiddling their thumbs for hundreds of years going, can we attack now? No. Can we attack now? No. Are we there yet? No. <laughs> see, that question goes back a long, long time. These nomadic groups, these hunter-gatherers, are oftentimes serving double duty. They're oftentimes merchants that travel from one civilization to the next. And so they see it. They go into these cities and they find out, huh, things aren't working very well. People aren't happy. I'm, you know, asking for permission from the government to set up a booth and it's taking a month to get a response because the government's not functioning. And I can't believe this. I could run this place better. An idiot could run this place better. So it's not like they're just sitting on the outside going, is it time to attack yet? Yes. People notice these declines. It's a slow process. And then finally, because we love to have winners and losers, the decline is worse, far worse, in Rome than in China or India. Western Rome collapses. It gone. In China, we're just going to have a brief layover. One dynasty will end, we're going to wait a couple hundred years, but we're going to get a brand new dynasty and life will go back to pretty much the way it was. And in India, they're like, what, the Guptas are gone? Huh, okay, I guess we'll go back to doing things the way we've always done them. Caste system, regional government, press play. Not a huge disruption at all. In fact, again, it's India's default setting. And so what we see is civilization spreading from these core initial areas. Mesopotamia, Indus, India, Huangha, China. Civilization, major civilization, civilization on the scale of China and India and Greece and Rome is going to begin to expand outward from those areas. And so you're going to see civilizations develop in Korea and Japan spread out to the island nations in the Pacific, into Southeast Asia, to the Middle East, throughout Africa, and then from the centers of civilization in the Americas, the Olmecs and the Chavan. Civilization will expand up through northern Mexico. You'll get the Aztecs. It'll spread out to the Yucatan Peninsula. You'll get the Mayans. It will spread all over the globe, slowly but surely. Yes, sir? How did people get from place to place Hawaii? They built a boat. I mean, it, the answer really is that simple. You would be in an, a coastal area, it would get crowded. Maybe there's a rivalry that develops. Maybe somebody slept with somebody else's spouse. Maybe somebody killed somebody else's son. Maybe st somebody stole somebody else's dog. And all of a sudden, you are no longer welcome there. And so you and your family pack up and leave, and you go to an island that you know is only a short distance away. And then from there, over the course of years, as you... You know, head out to sea every day to fish because you're on an island and that's where you get your food, come across another one. And so over time, you know, it's much like the strategy that the U.S. uses in World War II, island hopping. 
where they're fighting the Japanese and they jump from island to island to island to island to island. It's not like somebody in China was like, hey, I know what I'm going to do. We're going to sail for five months to Hawaii and hope it's there. No, they're going to go to the next island. And then new rivalry, you know, clan dispute. We want this leader. No, we want this leader. This leader wins. He kills that leader. That guy's followers run off to the next island. And then before long, there's another island that's in need of new inhabitants. Okay. That's how the the ocean's islands got inhabited. Well, and when we look on our maps, yeah. there isn't a whole lot there. But if you take something like Google Earth and really zoom in, this is full of islands that could support 15, 20, 50, 100 people. And that's what you see about those civilizations. They're small. Those islands don't support 50,000 people. But they can hold 100 until somebody gets mad at somebody else and then they're moving on to the next one. Um, what made collapse the civilization in Rome so Um, no, it, it's not so much the causes of their decline that make it the worst, it's the results. It's the fact that, civil, that Roman civilization stops in that part of the world and it doesn't restart. People never revive Rome. Instead, it turns into a variety of barbarian kingdoms, each one warring with each other, and then it turns into Western Europe's Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, where again, it's a whole bunch of feudal kingdoms that don't like each other and fight over small plots of land. Nobody ever restores the Roman Empire until maybe today with the European Union. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Not that early, but maybe sooner than it otherwise would have taken. Right, exactly. Am I? Well, again, you look at what was holding Rome together, or maybe what wasn't. There was no Roman religion that was going to bring people back. Because we already talked about how the Roman gods are not the example that you set for people. And then you look at the Roman government. And by the time the Roman Empire falls, their entire government is based on one charismatic emperor. Or not so charismatic in some cases. That's not a sustainable system. That's not something that you can just plug somebody brand new into and it works. Now you look at China, China had set up a system. Yes, it's one guy in power, but it's one guy in power through the mandate of heaven, a system that people can believe in. They had set up a bureaucracy that functioned that people recognized and could work with. You look at India, the caste system provided structure regardless of who was in charge. All of those places had a system. And so even if the people at the top are gone, even if some external thing comes in and causes grief for a while, there's a system to go back to. In Rome, there really wasn't a system because they had by that point long since left the Republic. Had they still had the Senate, maybe they could have revived that because you could have just plugged in new senators and the system could have continued, but because their society was based on a single all-powerful emperor to make all the decisions, and since they'd had a run of bad emperors, you know, Nero, Caligula, those guys are not great role models to begin with. And so when they're gone, there's no system to come back to. Say hell. Well, Greece didn't. Athens did. And so again, Athens would be able to survive longer, but if there's an invasion in Athens and it's a democracy and the invaders win, A, what are the, what are the chances the invaders keep the democracy? Because it's not like you want to get voted out right away. 
And even if you could keep democracy, now you're going to have inv invaders voting against the established citizens. I mean, that's just a recipe for disaster. But you look at the rest of Greece, and most of the rest of Greece had, you know, tyrannies. You know, they had single, all-powerful rulers. And so, again, there really isn't a strong system in place to keep things running. Nick, what were you going to say? Okay. Yeah, the Roman Senate might have. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of these places in a little bit more depth, and we'll start with China. Now, you guys already know about the Huns. You've seen Mulan. How many of you have not seen Mulan? I don't remember. Okay. There is always one. It's okay, though. We don't judge. Uh, it's not the, don't even start with the best movie. That's not the best movie. Really, in the history of cinema, Mulan's the best movie. Anyway, anyway. All right, so in China, we have to talk about the invasion of the Huns, but are the Huns the reason China falls? No, because you always have external and internal causes of decline. So let's take a look at some of the internal ones. The external one's easy. Huns. The guy with his falcon riding a little mountain pony. All by himself. Internally, though, there's already problems. There were problems within the bureaucracy. People within the government. Not people at the top of the government, but people in the middle or the bottom of the government. People whose jobs were not terribly important, and they realized it. And they realize, you know what? I go to work every day, and if I steal some of the supplies and take them home for my personal use, nobody's going to care. Well, now we got to pay to replace those because we still need them in the office. And if I take a two-hour lunch instead of a one-hour lunch, it's not like it's the end of the world. Well, the work backs up, never gets done. But my job's not that important, so who really cares? So because the work backs up, what does the government do? The government hires more workers because clearly that's the problem. There's too much work. We need more people working. But there really isn't that much work. So now you have more people sitting around twiddling their thumbs going, huh, I'm kind of bored. I have nothing to do. But I'm collecting a paycheck, so that's awesome. So the bureaucracy gets too big. It's paying too many people to do the work. So the work slows down. Because now there's more people that the work has to get passed along to. They've created a longer chain of decision-making. Now it goes from one secretary's desk to another, to another, to another, to another, to another, from one department to another, to a third, to a fourth, before somebody that can actually make a decision is able to say, yes, build that bridge, six months later. When government stops being as effective, what do the common people do? Nick? <clears throat> well, maybe they revolt. Before the revolt happens, though, what do they do? Sahil? All right, maybe they fall back on religion as their source of inspiration and hope. But in the practical day-to-day -day aspects of their life, what do they do? They make their own decisions. I'm not going to ask for permission because I know if I do, it's going to take me a month to get an answer. So I'm just going to go ahead and do what I think I want to do what I think probably won't get me in trouble, I'm going to do it anyway. And then if somebody gets mad at me, then maybe I'll have to apologize later. But why am I going to wait? It takes too long. Yes? Yeah. Right, because then I have to fill out all these permits, and I have to take them to the, you know, the permit office, but then the permit office says, well, we have to send it to the central planner's office. The central planners are looking at them like, well, we can't read this. We have to send it to the engineer's office. Well, they don't work today, so they're going to have to wait till tomorrow. And, oh, that guy's sick, and his boss is out to lunch, so you're just going to have to come back tomorrow. Like two weeks later, it comes back. Yep, okay, these look good. We'll send it back to where. And finally, you know, three weeks later, yes, you can start your bridge. Well, that doesn't help because I needed it three weeks ago. You know, if I want to redo my deck in my backyard, I have to talk to my HOA, and I have to talk to the county zoning board and make sure that they agree with my schematics for my new deck. And I'm like, dude, all I want to do is rip up a couple pieces of wood and put some new ones in. It's not that hard. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have to get permission. 
Well, not always, but it does seem to happen an awful lot. Well, or you end up with people that are overly concerned and don't want something bad to happen, but then everybody has to suffer, quote unquote, as a result. Mm hmm. Exactly. All right, so if the government stops functioning, if the central government isn't using its power effectively, where is that power going to go in terms of the people that are making decisions? Nick? Regional landowners. Regional landowners. Right. So picture the U.S., 50 states and a federal government. If the states feel like the federal government is taking too long to make decisions, what will the states do? They'll do it. They're not going to succeed. They're not going to succeed right away. I always forget I live in the South. They're not going to succeed right away, but they will start to make their own decisions. This is what you see happening in China. China is a big empire. And if the emperor, if the central government stops being efficient, all of those local leaders will be like, why would I waste my time asking for permission from the emperor? I'm just going to do what I want. And then there's always other stuff. There's an outbreak of disease throughout China. Yay, plague. Everybody loves a good plague. Except the people that get it. But, you know, they don't count. And then also in China, there's something that threatens the culture itself. There's a new religion that comes in. Now, prior to this point, what was Chinese society based on? Confucianism. Confucius' five relationships. Uh, you know, order and balance and a hierarchy. Know your place in society. Then Buddhism comes in. What does Buddhism say? Right. Take yourself away from materialism. Take yourself away from the rules of society. Stop doing what the man tells you to do. You can achieve enlightenment in your own life regardless of your hierarchy. You are all spiritually equal. That's in direct conflict. David? What did you say is kind of nameless place? You mean Confucius or Buddhist? Or, no, I mean the other one who was Buddhist. The what, what? The other one who was Buddhist. Oh, oh, oh. Um, well, China is still claiming to be communist. Mm -hmm. And so having a single party <coughs> rule the government, mm -hmm. um, even as they're trending a little bit more towards socialism or capitalism or a combination thereof. Um, but it's still uh, absolute rule by a single party. So maybe we could call it an oligarchy. Mm -hmm. China's hard to define right now. Well, and there certainly are strains of legalism that you see, too, where they certainly don't like it when their people talk back to them. So, Hill? They, they are definitely trying to figure out what the future holds for them. Um, kind of. I mean, they've been following communism since the 1950s. And as more and more of the world moves towards democracy and capitalism and free market exchange, and as more and more of the world has come to expect people to have certain rights, free speech, freedom of religion, um, freedom to protest and not get shot, um, China's getting more and more pressure from the rest of the world to be more like the rest of the world. Well, right, but we don't know what to do with North Korea. So, yeah, China, I guess you could say it's a period of transition. They're, they're trying to figure out how much of their culture they can keep and how much needs to be changed. And this is kind of the same thing that happens here when classical China falls and they try to rebuild. Okay, how much of what we had before was good and we can keep? And how much do we need to get rid of and try and change? And so what we ultimately see is that there's no permanent disruption of Chinese civilization. They bring back the dynasties. They bring back the bureaucracy. They bring back the civil service exam. They bring back Confucianism as kind of the bedrock principle of society. And life moves on. They decide after the classical China falls that, well, we can pretty much bring it back, resurrect it, and it worked. 
And so that will be what China looks like going forward for several hundred years after classical China falls. But again, two important things. It never just falls for one reason alone. And in China's case, it's going to come back very similar to what it looked like before. Yes, ma'am. Because what's hindsight? I like David's definition. 20 over nostalgia. Once you're past your past and you look backwards, it always looks pretty good. We tend to forget a lot of the bad things and romanticize a lot of the good things. All right, so we look at India. Again, external causes, also invaded by the Huns. Not the same guy, though. And in India, something different happens. The Huns actually blend into the caste system. Guess where they go? Warriors. At the top. Warriors. Yes. But again, that doesn't really shake up India because India is used to a hierarchy. And do the people at the bottom really care who's at the top? No. Not really, because they know it's not them. Good question. I honestly couldn't tell you for sure whether there was just a new class that went on top of the priests, whether the Huns kind of just called themselves Brahmins and it all kind of worked, or whether the Huns were happy to become warriors because they didn't want to deal with the religion itself. I don't know for sure, but they're in one of the top two classes, which basically means they get all the benefits of society and don't have to do much. Remember, too, that at this time, Buddhism was also starting to spread. And part of the reason why Buddhism never becomes terribly popular in India is because the invaders didn't want it. Which one's going to give the invading Huns a better shot at control and wealth? The caste system and Hinduism. Now, later on, once we get to the 600s, the end of the 600s CE, one of the new civilizations, the Arabs, will also invade India. Except it's not really invade. It's more like bring over a whole bunch of people that want to trade all at once. So it's like an invasion of merchants, which isn't nearly as scary as the Huns. They're never going to make a Mulan III invasion of the merchants, <laughs> thankfully. But in this case, it ends up being kind of a religious invasion. And Islam and Hinduism are going to duke it out. James? That would be terrifying. Unless we can go back like 20 years ago before the cell phone. Because then they'd have to bring their corded phones with them and then get stuck and they'd run out of room. That would be funny to watch. Yes, ma'am. No, but that's a great question. Um, India and Pakistan aren't going to get split until the 1900s. It's going to be a long, long time in the future. But this is going to be the beginning of the conflict between Hindus and Muslims. Because they're not going to be occupying the same space. And Islam is going to come in with a belief in a single God. And a single way to worship. And a prayer that all must pray. And a pilgrimage that all must take. How does that compare to Hinduism? Right, it's like, yeah, pick your God, pick your temple, pick the way you want to pray. You know, do what works. Very flexible. Islam comes in, there is one God. There is one prophet. There is one truth. Hinduism's like, yeah, I don't really agree with that. So there's going to be conflict there. Nick? Not quite. Well, look at India today. What's the dominant religion in India today? Hinduism. Well, this is the danger with jumping too far forward. We don't want to start talking about Pakistan yet 
because we still have almost 2,000 years of Hindus and Muslims coexisting in the areas that are India and Pakistan and any number of other places. But what's interesting here is how both religions continue to influence and control society. The Hindu caste system will still give India organization. But now Islam will come in with the five pillars and its belief in a single God. And that will give people structure as well. So again, we're going to have not one but two now very powerful religions supporting society. What's going to continue to happen with government? When religion is strong, government is weak. And so we're going to continue to see India be a regional or a series of regional kingdoms. In terms of like what they actually believed? I mean like when they invaded, did they want to embrace They wanted to benefit from it. Alright, we'll see you guys next class. Bye guys.